special thanks to Betty Wagner for her continued support of this lecture season. Uh, this lectureship, and thanks to our speaker this afternoon, Lori Johnson. This is the uh, Edward Jr. Edward Wank Jr. Endowed Lecture. Uh, Dr. Wank began his career with degrees from Johns Hopkins and Harvard, and an appointment as the chair of engineering mechanics at the Southwest Research Institute. After a few years, in 1959, he decided to follow his passion to Washington, D.C., and became the first science advisor to the U.S. Congress. Uh, several presidents later, and probably many, many sessions of Congress, uh, Washington perhaps came a little bit much for him, and he came to the other Washington, taking a joint appointment at the University of Washington as a faculty member in civil and environmental engineering and also in uh, urban planning, I'm sorry, in public policy. Uh, and eventually went on to found a graduate program in social management of technology, clearly far ahead of his times in realizing the need to bridge engineering and public policy. For his contributions in, as an engineer and a public servant, he received the highest honors in both professions, appointments to the National Academy of Engineering and the National Academy of Public Administration. In 1970, Dr. Wank, with uh, strong support from his family, established the Endowed Lecture to provide an opportunity for the UW CE community to better understand the societal impacts of engineering projects and bridge the gap between public policy and engineering. So today, we'll seek to bridge the gap between engineering and public policy surrounding natural hazard events, which uh, at the moment is probably wildfires. Our speaker this afternoon is Dr. Lori Johnson. Dr. Johnson is the current president of the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute and the recent chair of the Federal Advisory Committee on Earthquake Hazards. She has nearly 30 years of professional practice and research in earth sciences, urban planning, and public policy. She is currently a consultant to FEMA, the USGS, the California Earthquake Authority, the California Governor's Office, and probably many, many more entities, including the cities of San Francisco and Wellington, but not yet Seattle. This afternoon, she'll provide some key findings from her recent book, After Great Disasters, an in-depth analysis of how six countries manage community resilience. And as Seattleites, knowing that everything west of I-5 will be uh, destroyed when the big one hits, community resilience should be very, very near and dear to our hearts. Uh, so hopefully this afternoon will provide us a better understanding of community recovery from and resilience to natural hazards, including earthquakes. With that, I will give you Lori Johnson. Thank you, Laura. And it really is an honor to be here. Thank you, um, Mrs. Wagner, um, and for your endowment. Um, Professor Wank, actually, when I read that he had been at the Southwest Research Institute, that's my hometown, when I was a little girl, which would have been a few years after he was there, um, I used to love to have my mom take me to the Southwest Research Center because they, would, they did testing on monkeys. <laughs> but as a little girl, I loved to see all the monkeys, and that was like my favorite place to go on the way into the city. We lived out in the country, just north of that area. So a little bit of a connection there. Um, it was very surreal to be putting together this presentation without electricity, uh, without internet, uh, for the past five days, um, as my neighbors to the north, um, two were living in my house um, because they evacuated from the wildfire. I worked uh, in Sonoma County after the wildfires in 2017. The current fire is burning right up to the boundary of the 2017 wildfire footprint. Um, so many people that I know who just got back into their house are out there again um, facing this. So it's a very timely topic. And um, I thought I'd just ask you to kind of put yourself in a frame of reference of Seattle um, as we talk about this and think about what we can learn from past disasters to inform future recovery and resilience building efforts. Um, and I just looked at the King County Hazard Mitigation Plan which is in the process of being updated. Is anybody from King County or work with King County? 
Uh, great. Uh, so these are all the hazards that are listed in King County's plan. So, and all of these really could result in very catastrophic events. Um, what, as an urban planner, as engineers, we tend to focus, I tend to focus a lot of my work on events that are in geologically hazardous areas because of my geoscience background. Um, but also, um, as a planner, I'm also you know, really concerned with the built environment. Um, so some of these, like severe weather, don't necessarily have the same impact on the built environment um, as, uh, as others. Um, so we spend a lot of time thinking about uh, earthquakes, uh, the impacts of tsunami, volcano, wildfire, flood, and landslide. Um, sea level rise and other effects of climate change are something I'm going to talk about towards the end of my talk um, to where our research is headed right now. So as Laura mentioned, um, I'm drawing on some of the conclusions first from my book, After Great Disasters. Uh, you can download this. I'm going to leave two copies for the university. Um, you can uh, uh, download this, though, for free from the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. There's a long version and a short version. So the reason Rob and I, my colleague Rob Olshansky, we spent 30 years um, looking at rebuilding after different disasters. Um, and we wanted to basically, he was retiring, and we said, we want to kind of encapsulate this work. All the countries, or some of the key countries where we've spent time working, some of the key disasters, and look across these countries, both developed and developing countries, um, to look at the lessons um, that we can share with future mayors, presidents, governors, prime ministers, who are gonna face a, a catastrophic disaster. Uh, we started this work as urban planners really interested in the process of planning uh, for recovery in a post-disaster environment. So how do planners who normally do things, um, you know, deal with development applications and land use planning pre-disaster, how do they flip and deal with that, that, that post-disaster environment? Um, and how do you make plans for post-disaster recovery better? Uh, but with time, what we really began to recognize is that um, the real challenge is, is it, planning is really part of governance. And there are so many pieces of governance that kind of fit into the process of planning. And so this book really tries to look at how do you manage that whole process? How do you govern um, a really complex recovery like this? So um, the countries that we cover in this book and the disasters that we cover are uh, China and the 2008 uh, Wenchuan earthquake, which affected 30 million people and caused at least 69,000 deaths. Um, New Zealand, the 2010 2011 Christchurch uh, Canterbury earthquake sequence um, that killed 185 people and displaced many more, uh, both in the central business district and in, the, um, in, in some of the residential areas that were heavily damaged by land um, ground failures. Uh, Japan, the 1995 earthquake in Kobe, which killed 6,500 people. I was just over there a few weeks ago uh, as they looked towards the 25th anniversary of that event. Um, and then also the 2011 tsunami. Uh, India, the 2001 magnitude 7.7 .7 Gujarat earthquake, which affected five different major cities, and killed 13, over 13,000 people. Um, and then uh, in Indonesia, the 2004 tsunami. And many of these other, as, and then in the United States, Hurricane Katrina. But we used all of these events. Uh, we had one sort of central event in each, for each country, but then we also encompassed some, looked back and looked forward in time to understand how policy and governance had changed. So how did, how did we learn from, how did one country learn from a prior experience and how was it transposing that into the next experience? Um, so in the United States, for example, as we did Hurricane Sandy, I looked back at the World Trade Center disaster because many policies that we put in place and used in Hurricane Sandy really were developed in the aftermath of the World Trade Center disaster. And then we, wanted, we were curious about how those would be deployed um, in hurricanes, uh, after Hurricane Sandy, Superstorm Sandy. Uh, I also just want to make a call out to a colleague, Mike Lindell, who is a prof professor emeritus of Texas A&M University, my alma mater, whoop. And uh, we just uh, published a book called The Rutledge Handbook of Urban Disaster Resilience, Integrating Mitigation Preparedness and Recovery Planning. Mike did an incredible labor of love editing this um, multi-author uh, contribution. So um, that's an interesting book that if you're into this subject, you might want to look for. So I, I, that's a call out for that book as well. And Mike, thank you so much for coming here today. <laughs>
so as I mentioned, we are interested in catastrophic disasters. As I, as I laid, uh, gave you the, some of the statistics, you can see these are extraordinary levels of casualties, damage, and disruption. We're also, as I mentioned, urban planners interested in communities. We're interested in cities and, and how do cities deal with these kinds of disasters. And so when we talk about communities, we don't want to bind ourselves to administrative boundaries because disasters don't care whether they're in Seattle or the county or Spokane. Um, <clears throat> so we look at them, though, cities as complex, adaptive, open, and largely self-organizing um, systems um, comprised of many actors. Uh, so the process of recovery, in our mind, really is about how all those systems begin to repair themselves and start to function again. Um, and all those actors basically are contributing to that process. Uh, and, they, and all of those systems and actors are adapting to this new environment that they find themselves in. So for us, recovery is a process. It, it doesn't have necessarily have an endpoint because at some point you're just dealing with the remaining issues and it becomes part of normal development, um, uh, redevelopment, blight, or other issues that planners normally deal with. So there's not necessarily a clear outcome or a clear endpoint for most catastrophic events. And we can talk about that a little bit more. One of the things that Rob and I uh, began to uh, really think about after the Kobe and earthquake and other disasters was what was different about urban planning and urban development in a post-disaster environment. There was something different, and it really wasn't until New Orleans that we kind of began to get our head around this. We call it time compression. And what it really means to us is that a city is kind of going along, replacing roads, and infrastructure at a certain rate, investing in schools at a certain amount. Um, and so a disaster basically in an instant takes out a whole bunch of that capital stock and services. And so all of a sudden, those actors involved in those processes that move at a certain rate um, are faced with having to do, do make more decisions and take more actions in a very short period of time. So we call it time compression, and we're very interested in how other fields, how this affects the thinking in other fields. We basically continue to look at this from the standpoint of planning, and how do you plan in this time compressed environment where many people need to make decisions and act simultaneously. So you'll hear me talk about that a lot in this presentation. So the central dilemma for, that we believe for recovery management is really that challenge of planning and acting, going fast, or taking time to think, be smart, deliberate. Is what, speed versus deliberation is another set of terminologies that we use for this. Uh, and that's what this book really tries to get at, is what is the advice that we can give a, a mayor, a governor, others for, for dealing with this time compressed uh, environment that they'll find themselves in after catastrophic event and after those immediate issues of responding to you know the basic human needs um, but starting to put together the the long-term recovery plan and, and outlook uh, so the other thing I just want to say this is a scene from uh, Christchurch um, at the moment the second damaging earthquake in the sequence hit um, you can see the dust cloud, which is basically the mortar and the buildings um, being shaken um, up into the air. And um, imagine yourself, imagine yourself as a resident. Um, and this is really uh, one of the, this is a quote from one of the first researchers in our field. Um, and they said something that, I, that really sticks with me as a planner every time I work with a community. Uh, they said, when disasters strike, there is already a plan for reconstruction indelibly stamped in the mind of every affected resident the plan of the pre-disaster city. This is the first recovery plan. And all previous plans or new plans made following the disaster will undoubtedly compete for many residents with the first plan, oftentimes intensely. And that really is where, um, where I spend a lot of my time, is helping local leaders begin to understand um, just how combative this environment can be and how they can work to be to make this a much more collaborative and engaged process that will ultimately empower them as leaders and empower the community to be good recovery actors. So in our, in our book, what we really do is, is outline what we think are sort of four factors that affect recovery management. 
um, and really are kind of like levers that you can use um, to, to, um, as a leader in managing recovery. The first is money. <laughs> Another one is information. We feel like those are two things that really fuel a recovery process. Obviously, money does, but so does information. Again, because all these actors need to make decisions and act. Um, collaboration basically is the, the spontaneity, the energy, and balancing time, this issue of time constraint. If a, if a leader can really understand and get their head around time frames, uh, they tend to do better. So I'm gonna first talk about those four factors and then talk about the recommendations from our book. Uh, so first about money. <laughs> Recovery really becomes a process of finding and managing money. Um, finding the sources of public funds, which we in the United States have money that gets um, in initially allocated for emergency response and a little bit for recovery through a, it, when we have a presidential declared disaster. But a lot of the recovery money actually has to come through a supplemental kind of action by state legislators or Congress or from your insurance company or from your own personal wealth um, or charitable foundations to fill the gaps. So, for local governments, for state governments, for individuals, recovery is a process of finding and managing funds um, and applying those funds to what's needed at the right time, which is tricky. Um, you need to be able to access it quickly, spend it efficiently, effective, effectively, and equitably. And I say equitably because Equitable is not necessarily equal, which is always a challenge with public policy, because public policymakers want to say every house will give you up to X amount and that's it, but some people need more, some people need less, uh, and so that always becomes a problem in disasters. Um, so this is just a list from some of our case studies of some of the major sources of funds. Um, and this is to really kind of help us begin to think about other ways we could think about uh, spending our, dis our precious public funds. So in the US, as I mentioned, a federal disaster de a declaration triggers some recovery funding, but Congress typically for some of these big disasters has had to provide supplemental funds for long-term reconstruction. This typically comes through HUD and the Community Development Block Grant process. New Zealand had a national insurance program, um, and then they also provided additional funding for infrastructure and for key what they called anchor projects, which were a, a lot like what we pay for with our federal recovery dollars under the, uh, as part of a presidential de declaration. Things like rebuilding stadiums and uh, transportation centers and civic buildings. Um, in China, they did a very interesting thing, which they've done at other times, non-disaster times, but basically they asked all the undamaged eastern provinces to allocate a portion of their budgets to help a, a, a stricken area in the western part of China where the Sichuan earthquake happened. So it was sort of a, um, a, a, a pairing system um, in which a, a wealthier undamaged um, jurisdiction was putting a small portion which they could provide either in funds or in in-kind services to support the recovery. In Indonesia, they matched their money with an international donors, um, a whole bunch of uh, different donors, but created this multi-donor fund uh, that really augmented the national funds. So we don't typically allow for international investment in our disasters, um, but in the future we might need to. Um, the big thing about money, as I said, is it's one of the fuels of recovery. It really is the dominant factor when we look across all these disasters about both the quality uh, and the pace of reconstruction. And whoever has the most money typically has the most control of the reconstruction process. Um, so you'll often see if there is a state or a federal agency that's very, very involved, um, they want to make sure there's more controls um, and will get involved in setting up a state reconstruction authority, or in New Zealand, it was a national department that was put in place. Um, but typically, they're very engaged in making sure the money is spent well, is, um, is audited, um, and this is true in all of our cases. So now about information flows. This is really about um, agencies, in particular, how they work to gather information, integrate information, distribute information effectively to all these actors. The agencies that tend to uh, manage money and manage information together and do that well tend to do better than those that don't manage and distribute information. 
Um, the media and uh, being savvy about the media is also really important. Um, and we see real differences in governments and their ability to, to work through all of those different uh, formal and um, informal uh, networks. Uh, so just some examples of how organizations have managed information in the United States. We had a really good model after Hurricane Sandy uh, where Pres then President Obama put together a rebuilding task force and they were of federal agencies working with state agencies across the multiple states that were affected by Hurricane Sandy to basically share information, work together over a, a one-year period of really getting their act together and aligning what they were doing. So people weren't duplicating efforts, they weren't in silos as much as um, other as we've seen in other disasters. And then at the other extreme, you know, when you don't have all of that sophistication and resources, like in a place like India, they set up little sub-centers where you could basically go and collect, they put in some NGOs to basically man these centers and people could go and get information there and share information um, <clears throat> with, with government, with their neighbors, um, and with construction trades. So two extremes. The other issue is really about transparency and accountability. We tend to see leaders losing um, re-election if they're not too transparent <laughs> and engaged and accountable in the process. Um, and that can really range as well from something sophisticated as like a, a system in New Jersey where they published every single grant that they were allocating um, to something like what we saw in Tamil Nadu um, where they basically posted a list. We saw the same thing in China. You'd go to a village and people's names and what they had received for money was on a list. Um, but that kind of transparency is really, really important to people uh, uh, and to have faith in the process and faith in their leaders. About collaboration, this is really not just about government agencies working together, it's about government agencies engaging with residents, with business owners, with non-governmental organizations, with utilities and all the service providers in the community, and then also all the funders, um, including insurers and financial institutions, um, and supporting multiple collaborative networks throughout society. Um, this kind of broad stakeholder ownership is really what you want to see. You want people owning their recovery and feeling like they're empowered to own their recovery. That's what makes a recovery sustainable, um, where you see sort of the process through rather than it breaking down. Uh, one of the saddest things that I've seen so many times is that uh, you'll have one administration, one political party come in and put a lot of money and energy into something, and then there's election, people lose faith in that process or whatever, uh, parties change, and all those plans basically go out the door and you have to start over again. Um, so engaging people really distributes that ownership and you don't have such vulnerabilities um, to leadership changes. So as planners, this is the kind of stuff we set out to originally understand. Um, there's a picture on the right that I took back in 1995 in Kobe of planners that the city had actually hired to go out and work in neighborhoods, just like engineers go out and inspect buildings in a post-disaster building safety assessment. These planners were work assigned to work with different neighborhoods, and then they would come together once a week and share. Uh, so this is like one neighborhood on the right where they're, they put all the different plans up. Here's an inventory of all the housing. Here's an inventory of all the businesses in this neighborhood, all the different assets. And they were talking through exactly what methods and techniques they were going to use in that neighborhood, and then the other planners were using that um, for what they were doing in their neighborhoods. On the other extreme, you see something here like in Gujarat in India, where the government actually supported a, a, a very sophisticated network that um, went out and con it was a, a network of NGOs that went out and worked with all these different governments, um, local governments and local organizations in these five different cities affected by that earthquake. So across our cases, we saw really good examples of this kind of collaboration. And we, we believe as planners, this is very, very important to empowering people and engaging people to stay in their neighborhoods, um, to reconnect and rebuild those social ties if they get displaced. Um, so there's many good examples that we talk about in our book. But also things like infrastructure rebuilding alliances. In the case of New Zealand, um, they actually put together a, um, an alliance between the, the owners of infrastructure, the city, the national government, and then um, as a funder, but also the National Transport Agency for the, the road repairs, um, and five different contracting firms. And through that process, they were able to actually spread the risk. 
Um, so it wasn't just the risk um, being outsourced to in individual contracts, but basically managing collectively the design of all of this infrastructure, putting incentives into that process, uh, and sharing in overrides and other kinds of risks that typically come into construction processes together. Um, and it's a great example of, of how um, a collaboration can be effective in recovery. The last thing is balancing time constraints. Um, this is about meeting the, first those initial needs of response um, and for early recovery, but also setting up um, to be able to execute over the long term um, and understanding those different time frames. Um, one of the most important things that we see is something that I worked with in Sonoma County and elsewhere, um, where, where basically you encourage, you basically try to encourage streamlining bureaucratic processes. Maybe there are ways we don't have to go through the same building permit um, processes and review processes after a disaster if you're not really changing anything. Um, so how do you basically streamline those processes so you can make up speed? Um, and sometimes we believe if you slow down, you actually gain speed later. So if you take time to think things through, you can actually catch up later. Um, and that's sometimes not intuitive for people to think about in the real, in the moment, in the heat of the moment. Um, the other way to deal with speed is to broaden information channels. So if you can just give more information, then you can encourage more action and you, you gain speed rather than one entity sort of being siloed having to do this work themselves. So those first researchers that I mentioned earlier about their quote about um, the pre-disaster plan being what everyone had before, were the first to put together a timeline of recovery after a disaster and talked about phases. And we don't really think of it, it's not this ordered um, when you, when, in, nowadays when we talk about it. One phase doesn't just stop perfectly and the next one starts. But I love this timeline because it's very simple to explain what I, what I feel is really important about understanding time and speed. Um, the first thing they said that I think is still very true is that every period, the emergency period, the restoration period, the rebuilding of the same thing versus rebuilding with any change, that's what they called reconstruction one and two, every period is exponentially longer than the previous period. So the emergency period lasts days, weeks. Uh, the restoration period lasts weeks to months. The rebuilding like for like can last months to years, uh, and reconstruction where there's change, improvements, getting resilience into recovery can often take many, many years. So that's a challenge. If we really want resilient rebuilding, we have to slow down. So how do you do that? Uh, and one of the things, as I was saying, about um, streamlining processes is to think about empowering all those people where they need to be empowered and not wasting their time where they don't. Um, so one of the things as urban planners we learn a lot about is public participation. Um, and this is just basic, the, the, there's a whole chart that sits underneath this, but it's called the public participation spectrum. And it talks about whether you just inform people of some of policy that you're doing versus at the other extreme, you really try to empower them as part of the decision making. And I like to lay this up to on this timeline and essentially say that across the disaster, um, you want to be selective about where you're doing this work um, in public participation. Don't spend a lot of time engaging people if you're just going to let them rebuild what they had. Let them get on with it. Streamline the process. Uh, clear the decks. You know, don't, do a, don't waste a lot of time doing planning processes for that. Focus on those areas. Um, take the time to deliberate those areas where you know change is inevitable. Areas with severe ground damage. Areas where you have a lot of catastrophic infrastructure failure or building failures. Um, those kinds of areas where you know you need to redevelop for a, per for a betterment in the community. Um, the other thing about time is that you don't actually have control over it. <laughs> so in the case of the Canterbury earthquake sequence, I love to use this example uh, because the, uh, an aftershock came literally every six months. So just as they were getting through restoration and starting to get into that initial rebuilding process, boom, they got hit again, they had to go back and do building inspections again, infrastructure inspections again, reallocate money to the disaster, claims mounted upon claims um, for, with insurance companies. So it really reset the clock, not just physically on the disaster, but emotionally for people. Uh, and that um, really exacerbated 
a, what, what I call a differential recovery, but where you look across a landscape and no one play, no city is all in one of those phases that Haas and Kate showed. You actually, as you look down in a bird's eye view, some people are restoring, some people are rebuilding like for like, some people are starting over from scratch. Um, and what's really important to remember is that this is about actors or people. Um, and so these are just some, some, a cartoon that showed that there were four tribes of Christchurch at the time of um, two years on from the first earthquakes. Uh, the angry, the disillusioned, the untouched, and the hopeful. And on the right are just some really extraordinary statistics for mental health and chronic stress that the society had endured five years on. And this was a very well-funded, fairly well-managed event. Um, so disasters are really, people now in Sonoma have PTSD. You know, they're looking at this, um, the wildfire happening again uh, and going through this and basically having that clock reset. Um, so the, the impacts of disasters can be um, really severe for people for a very long time. You never get over it. So our seven recommendations, I'll just kind of pop through these in clusters. Um, the first two I want to talk about is just, you, these again are to a manage, if you're the governor or a mayor of a place that's just been hit. First of all, don't try to build new, new governance structures. Try to enhance existing governance structures um, and promoting information flow and collaboration. So what we see too often is people trying to set up a new agency, trying to set up a brand new program, and it takes time to do that. It takes time to think all that through, um, and, and too often valuable time is wasted doing that work. You can, you can adapt existing institutions um, if, you, if you're focused on what you need to adapt them to do. The other important thing is to keep disasters as local as possible. In our minds, one of the saddest things I see is when we set up national departments or national agencies get involved in disasters, they make land use decisions, people aren't involved, local officials aren't involved, and when the national agencies or state agencies are gone, local communities are left with these decisions that they really didn't they didn't want or they didn't really, they're not invested in. So empowering local governments to implement recovery actions, actually having states and federal agencies work in empowering um, local governments to act and building their capacity. This is what uh, Judy Innes and her colleagues call collaborative network governance. So too often in America, we really think about governance as command and control. So often in recovery, I hear even yesterday, I'm working with San Francisco, and someone from the chief administrator's office said, well, who's going to be the czar? Who's going to be the czar? Um, and that's not what you want in recovery. We need command and control in response, but you need to learn as leaders to transition to what Judy calls a collaborative network form of governance. That's what she refers to as, instead of a director leader, you have a manager, a mediator, a process manager, that the goals um, are not linear in nature, they're non-linear, that the, the, the process itself is, is really um, what you're trying to achieve rather than focusing on the end state. Um, and that people being engaged in joint learning and deliberation really builds their capacity. So we in the United States, um, since Hurricane Katrina, have been trying to kind of move in this direction with our recovery. Um, we have now something called a National Disaster Recovery Framework, and Seattle is one of the first cities in the United States to actually build a city-level recovery framework that's based on the model outlined in the National Disaster Recovery Framework. One of the key recovery tasks um, sort of functions, as they're called in this framework, is local capacity building and community planning. And that really gets at this issue of trying to have government, federal agencies, and state agencies not get in and take a command and control approach, but rather provide technical consultants and capacity to local governments to make their decisions. The other important point for governments to recognize is that all sorts of new organizations emerge. And they do that to fill gaps. Government can't do everything, particularly providing information. So this is just an example of a whole group of planners that got together in New Orleans, just on their own, and started sharing information, and did almost exactly the same thing that I showed you in Kobe. And they were doing it by themselves, without government involved, but saying, hey, I'm working in this neighborhood. I'm working in this neighborhood. What are you doing here? How can we share techniques? Um, and what we say to governments is support these, stay out of their way, don't freak out about them, <laughs> uh, because too often they do. Um, 
The next set of recommendations is a little bit more in the weeds, but it's important about really how we think about funding the process and, and managing the process. One, learning to plan and act simultaneously. This is very hard for organizations to do. The next is budgeting for more than just the infrastructure or the cost of the project itself. With recovery, you have to, if you're gonna empower all those actors that are involved in, this, in any process, you need to budget um, significantly for communications, for planning, and you need to be willing to revise budgets with time. We do not do a very good job of that uh, in the United States. We get very steadfast and committed to the amounts we, um, we commit to projects and, and um, don't really uh, set up good performance indicators to track our progress and challenge ourselves as to whether we're even getting to our goal. Um, and, and now back to all of that data management, communication, transparency, and communication. Um, and accountability, those are all really important. Some examples um, that we've thought about in terms of how you plan and act simultaneously is, um, and I'll show you some of these. One is just in, in terms of planning, is one, you can increase capacity. So you can ha just have more staff, more people planning at the same time. Another one is you can sort of set standards and allow the process to be decentralized. This is what Louisiana did after Hurricane Katrina, where the state said, here's what we want from your recovery plan, and every parish did that work simultaneously. Another way is what, is what Japan did after the Kobe earthquake, where it designated some areas where it was gonna take more time to plan, and it let everybody just called the rest of it a white zone and said, get on with it. You don't need to, we're not gonna take your time to ask you any questions, you can just get on with rebuilding. Um, so that's what we call iterative planning, where you take steps. As you get more information, you'll dig in deeper, but you take that process, you basically dissect an environment, and you're trying to sort of shed off as much as you can to just get on um, and, and not delay and focus more on the troublesome areas. So China's pairing system is a great example of both decentralization and increased planning capacity. At one point in time, there were thousands of planners working on the recovery for all the different communities that had been stricken by this earthquake. Uh, Kobe in New Zealand, as I mentioned, did this iterative process in Kobe. In New Zealand, they, they designated, they looked across the entire um, area looked at the ground failure and came up with different te technical categories for rebuilding. So there were green zones, there were yellow zones where they were going to do more research on, on uh, before they came up with the foundation design criteria, and then there were red zones where they actually said you can't rebuild. Uh, but that's the kind of iterative planning. Um, they got better information and eventually broke up the, the yellow zones into either green zones or red zones. Um, a process that I was involved with in New Orleans, the Unified New Orleans Plan, was really a great example where um, there really just wasn't enough money for the kind of planning that was needed. This is what really troubles me when I think about a really large West Coast earthquake, a Cascadia earthquake, um, or a, 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 a California earthquake, where we might actually have people distributed off a great area um, across the country in this case, there were, there were people who were evacuated from Katrina in 50 states. Every single state received Katrina evacuees. Um, and in that case, it was really hard to do participatory planning. How do you connect all those people back to their neighborhoods? Um, government really didn't want to pay for such an expensive process, so the Rockefeller Foundation stepped in to do so, um, but they didn't have enough money for communication, and that caused a lot of problems. Um, eventually, we had to raise more money to get that process done, um, but it was actually um, an important example of just understanding that what you think it would cost you for normal planning processes actually more than quadrupled when we put all the communication costs into this process. <clears throat> A very interesting rule from an engineer who was the head of the Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Authority, he called it the 10% rule. And I think about this just, I challenge the engineers to think about this, which was, he said, you know, everybody likes that rugby stadium that we just threw up at 10% of the cost of rebuilding a stadium. It's worked fine. We're happy with it. This container mall, nobody wants it to go away now. When the downtown commercial district was torn down, they improvised and created this container mall, and tourists love this. And now the merchants love it too and want it to stay. So I think we need to think more, especially as we think about adapting in a changing environment, to less formalized and permanent kinds of construction. The other point I just want to say about New Zealand is just, so 
so many processes and standards um, are very science-based. Engineers are really very engaged in the process. Um, everything is very evidence-based in New Zealand compared to some of the way we manage our disasters here. There was a royal commission that investigated the building failures soon after um, the Christchurch earthquakes. Uh, they had a well-being index that tracked people's well-being in two different forms. One, data that they could get from agencies. Another, where they surveyed people, asking them questions every six months for many years. Um, they also have a human rights commission that got involved in actually challenging um, the government itself, as a government, sort of an impartial government agency, challenging policies that the government was undertaking and using in the recovery. And then lastly, they had an auditor general, which we do have, um, that, that went in and followed various programs um, and audited those from a policy point of view. So my second to last recommendation is about back to that speed. Reconstruct quickly, but don't be hasty. Um, I think this is so important for us to remember is that too often we count houses, we count things, how many miles of street, how many houses, how many buildings have been repaired. Um, but, for, but for meeting the needs of people, it's more complicated than that. Sometimes it's, it, it, it's, it's about their livelihoods, it's about their cultural and social connections. These things have to be thought of too. Um, and re rebuilding too quickly often means reducing people's involvement in the process. Um, which usually creates dissatisfaction with the result. Uh, so this is an example where Kobe was panicked after the 1995 earthquake. 200,000 people had been displaced, and they had this property. It was on a former steel site, but it wasn't connected to transit in any way. Japan is not a car society. People move by trains. Uh, and um, so all of this housing got constructed out there, and it really lacked those social, the connection back, not just to the transportation network, but to the neighborhoods that people had lived in before. And it's never been successful. And they'll even tell you that. We were there just a few weeks ago and remarking about how it's better. Um, China uh, didn't allow a rebuilding in two cities and quickly built um, new Beishuan um, down in the plains away from the mountains where people had lived. Uh, and it is starting now, 10 years on, uh, to, to get some life to it. But it really struggled for many years. And people struggled to really feel uh, connected in this, in, in this relocation project. Uh, and it didn't have good economic, the, the, the industries didn't relocate there the way they had intended. My last recommendation, which leads me into the second part of my conversation about uh, thinking about uh, climate change and dealing with things like sea level rise, is about what we really saw um, as a perplexing issue, which is about how, what, do you deal, what do you do when land is really damaged, um, as many of our disaster cases were, um, lahars from volcanoes, uh, earthquake damaged areas. Um, and our view is that you really should avoid permanent relocation of residents and communities except in rare cases and only with full participation of residents. And I say this is really a dilemma for us because we know we're gonna face more relocation and managed retreat issues in the future. Um, so we, we are really spending, kind of pivoting and focusing our research on that, and I'll share that with you now. Um, relocation disrupts more than just the physical aspects of a community. It disrupts the social and the economic aspects, and those are so often not thought of when we start to think about relocation. Um, residents are attached to their houses, but they're also attached to their neighbors. Um, just where they are, you know, where the land, you know, one of the things, uh, the Lower Ninth Ward in New Orleans, people were given their particular plots of land, their ancestors were given that as part of reparations after the Civil War. So that particular piece of land was very, very important to them and their families. And that, I think, was not really very well communicated or understood by the media uh, and by many people who judged um, uh, people for why they wanted to stay in the Lower Ninth Ward. Um, and sometimes there are compelling reasons to relocate, and if so, you have to engage people. So this is the example of what became that red zone that I talked about in Christchurch. Um, this is some of the land damage, the ground failure in one of those neighborhoods. And on the right is um, something that the community constructed. Those are the mailboxes from people's houses and the street names. Um, so after it, everybody was bought out, um, they put this down at the t near, kind of in the commercial center of that little community. 
um, as a way to remind politicians <laughs> and also themselves of, of um, their, their streets. They didn't want them lost forever. They wanted the names of those streets remembered. Um, so our cases really illustrate the challenges of relocation. Um, and I'll say this, it's more than a buyout. What we typically do in the United States is pay you to leave. We don't care where you go. We, we basically leave it to market forces. And that's what they did in New Zealand as well. And I think as we deal with the future and the challenge of the future, we're going to have to think about where people go, um, not just where, where, where we're buying them out from. Um, and while it may reduce natural hazard risk, it, doesn't, it may create other risks. Um, and that's something that we have to balance. And the term acceptable risk is really a socially determined element. It is not something that is just an engineering um, construct. And we have to engage people in that process to understand it. The other thing that we saw so often was finding an appropriate site when you really want to think about where people are going to go. It's really hard to do. It's very hard to actually assemble the land for people to go to. <clears throat> So some of our conclusions from the book, and then I'll talk a little bit about resilience. Um, recovery is always complex. It's never fast enough for affected residents. And we need to set those expectations at the outset. Too often, right after the event, you'll hear a leader say, we will rebuild in two years. We will rebuild in five years. Uh, and then we basically march towards that time goal. Uh, with, without really a clear understanding of where we're going to get the money, how we're going to actually put things in the right sequence to do them uh, effectively in, in a particular time frame. But we can be smart and fast at the same time. And we believe it's really about those four things. Empowering people to participate in the process, ensuring that information is transparent and communicated, paying for planning and communication, and ensuring governance is appropriate for managing money and information and a foresighted community that thinks about recovery processes before the next disaster, like Seattle, it can reduce their risk now and can act to ease for future recovery process. This is what we think resilience is. We think if you're thinking about recovery, if you're use, you can use recovery as a lens to think about resilience. Um, because you really need to think through over a longer time horizon than we typically do when we model things like death dollars um, and those immediate kinds of losses. Um, resilience, um, the lenses of resilience are more complicated than, than what we just see in those sort of initial disaster calculations. So planning ahead improves community resilience. It improves the ability of a community to survive, adapt, and recover, which is what resilience is. Um, so just a few thoughts about this notion of resilience. The way I think about this is kind of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, that, that essentially, in, as you look at a community, you should look at this sideways, not the way we typically look at it as engineers and planners. You know, I sit in the, on the left side of this looking up this pyramid too often. I think about the land first and the buildings. I'm not, I'm not like a social scientist who's looking at this pyramid from the top down. But to do good community resilience, we have to kind of think of this entirely, which my, my view is that you have to kind of look at it sideways. Um, so I, I'm promoting a different view of, of, of thinking about resilience. The other thing I want to say about resilience is that, um, and this is really a, a graphic I put together thinking about earthquakes. Um, and I would say with wildfires, I'm probably thinking about it a little differently. But my point is that resilience really requires a range of strategies. We have spent a lot of our field time and as planners and engineers thinking about engineering resilience, making sure buildings are strong enough and infrastructure strong enough to withstand the shock. But there are a whole bunch of other resilience tools to use. Adaptive resilience is basically the moment of resilience is at the time of the event itself. Think of things like backup generators or um, um, uh, adaptive techniques that a building um, can use in a flood, um, breakaway walls, things like that. Um, and transformative resilience, I, I think, is really something that we need to spend a lot more time thinking about as we think about uh, climate change, which is that you're really moving to a new place. And you're actually thinking about 
using all of these together. So you might still have engineering resilience, but when engineering resilience doesn't work or we can't afford to make it completely, a building completely resilient to all the, the potential uh, shocks and stresses, then we have to have these other strategies in place as well. And when I said that for an that this to me is more like an earthquake. You know, what I just have been through this past week and what I've seen people going through now, multiple seasons with the wildfires, um, I think that adaptive resilience has to start even sooner, that we need to be doing more of it in advance, um, of essentially basically thinking about buildings that aren't just hardened, but that are adaptive, that we're adaptive to, that we're immediately um, recognizing what, um, <clears throat> what we're gonna do when the limitations of engineered systems fail. So some of the post-disaster resilience observations that we have from the book, um, the first is that in almost all of our cases, uh, rebuilding was done to higher engineering standards. Um, and most of our rebuilding cases also had strong science-driven recovery policy examples. So this is really heartening. We're not just rebuilding without thinking about engineering and science. Um, the other point is that resilient rebuilding really means building back, may mean building back very differently. So it, it, there's a lot of change that's involved in a resilient reconstruction. Um, and I think there will have to be more change in the future, relocating different kinds of designs, different kinds of materials, easing, um, making things to be more, easily repaired, which is what we're talking about now. Things like functional recovery standards is what many of us are talking about in the field. Um, <clears throat> but we have to recognize that that kind of change takes more time. And we as professionals need to set the expectations of owners uh, and leaders to understand that, it, that to do this right really does require more time. And we also have to recognize that perceptions of risk will change with time. So often we see communities immediately after an event say, we don't want to have that ever happen to us again. But then like in Japan, after the tsunami, when 30 meter high tsunami walls started getting constructed in coastal communities and people could no longer see the sea, People said, well, that really wasn't what I had in mind. You know? And now, four years, five years on, seven years on, people really don't like living behind that wall and not seeing the sea anymore. So risk perceptions will always change at time, and we as professionals have to be ready for that and understand that. The other thing that's important to understand is that the funding streams that come in for recovery don't necessarily promote risk reduction and they don't come at the right times. So in New Orleans, so often people would say, I'm rebuilding the second floor of my house before the first floor, because the money to repair their house had come from their insurance company, but the money to elevate their house from the government to now create a first floor and elevate the old house is gonna be the second floor, they didn't have that money yet. Um, so, that was, so things get kind of out of sync. Um, and to be effective, resilience policies, including engineering standards and science investigations, need to consider more than the previous disaster. Um, we have to think more in a multi-hazard risk perception point of view. We have to be looking to the future and how these risks are dynamic. Wildfires today are not wildfires tomorrow. Wind events are going to change, um, as an example. Um, we have to think about sustainability from an energy perspective, community well-being, livelihoods, design, satisfaction, and equity. So one other way to think about this is that too often we think of things from a structured focus point of view. The majority of policy principles that we tended to see emphasize quantity, as I mentioned, counting things, time, the rates of construction, the structural standards, the cost. Um, an overemphasis of any of these can have an inappropriate or unintentional consequence. Um, we believe you have to also have resilience policies, rebuilding policies that are people focused, that emphasize well being, accessibility, the design, and the satisfaction. Um, and these often receive greater emphasis over time. They're not the things people talk about in the beginning, but they become more important with time to people as they recover. And that's really what Dr. Roden, Judith Roden, formerly uh, president of the Rockefeller Foundation, meant by the resilience dividend. That if we actually invest in resilient infrastructure, resilient buildings, there can be these other societal benefits. Um, in 
in actually making communities more livable, more enjoyable, stronger social ties, et cetera, if we do it right. So resilience can have many co-benefits if we do it right. So a bit of our research before I wrap up um, into planning for environmentally forced relocation. What we're doing now is looking back across all of our disaster cases and many more. I think, I don't know what our number is now, but we're well over 50 cases. Um, and we're looking at what, how did communities decide to relocate? Um, when did they decide? Um, who decided, where did they go to, um, and how did all these other issues, social and economic issues, get addressed, not just the physical decision. Um, so a framework that we're using um, that we think are really the issues planners typically face um, in making land use decisions is there's the natural science, of course. So with sea level rise, what, is, what are the flooding levels in the next five years, 10 years, 50 years, 100 years? Uh, as an example. Um, and with that then comes a risk decision, which as I said, needs to be a socially determined decision. Um, but then after you think about that, you also now need to think about these other issues of livelihoods, the economy and social ties. The process of leaving one place and going to another, right now I'm still involved in the buyouts in Christchurch in the red zone. The, the process of replanning for the red zone, the, the actual taking back of all the land use rights, all the easements, all the utility lines. This is a mini multi-year process. So just the process of leaving has to have much more attention than we currently are spending on that. Um, and that leads to things like thinking about property rights, who has them, the sources of funding to do all that kind of work and how you're gonna finance it. And then there's also all the politics um, and other planning goals. It's never just about safety, um, uh, and, and it's a very complex issue. Um, so one thing we're kind of looking at is just really how do you begin to think about the hazard risk and estimating the probability of that versus estimating the probability of all of these other social risks? Um, and how can you actually kind of create a typology to balance those and understand those, quantify those um, at least qualitatively quantify those um, to understand how they relate one to the other in scale. So emerging themes from our case studies, um, as I've kind of goes back to our conclusions, communities are economic and social networks. They're harder to move than buildings, but still moving buildings is really expensive. If we really are gonna retreat from the coastline, this is a very expensive endeavor, and we have to start planning for that financially. As I mentioned, finding a new site um, is also very difficult in every way. Um, for relocation to be successful, community members must be active partners. Um, acceptable risk is socially determined and people balance all the risks in their lives. So, so often I hear people say, but that doesn't matter to me. What matters to me right now is if my, I can keep my kid in the school, if I can still get to my job within an hour or two hours. Uh, these are the risks people face every day. Um, a probabilistic risk map is scientific, but the color of the map is social and political decision. So as we think about maps, <laughs> as any of you might be involved in that kind of decision, um, it's actually very important to think about those, where we make those boundaries in those categories um, and differentiate risk. Um, Many people are very happy to stay in Christchurch right now in the red zone. There are still many people living in the red zone, even though the government threatened to take away their utilities. Um, they have not been able to do that, given some lawsuits. Um, and people are very happy to stay behind, even with limited services. Um, relocation may reduce natural hazard risks, but create these other economic and health risks. And it's never an all or nothing binary choice for anybody. And with that, I just wanna say thank you and open it up for questions.